I can't say I was the most careful and um, slow moving of children. So there were times when I would be running around the house or messing around at the kitchen table with my brother and accidents would happen. For example, I would want to help my dad when he was painting the walls in the laundry room and um, I would run in there to help him and accidentally knock over a paint can or something like that. And uh, sometimes at the dinner table, I might be a little careless and, and go to pass somebody the rolls and accidentally knock over my glass of iced tea. And when my parents became upset with me, I would say something like, I didn't mean to do that. And their response would be, well, what was your parents? What, what did your parents say? Well, mine said, the road to hell was paved with good intentions. <laughs> and there's some truth in that saying because there's a right way to do the right thing. And in this week's uh, lectionary reading for the eighth Sunday after Pentecost, the Old Testament reading is in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And this is a kind of an interesting little uh, passage there because in it, the Bible tells us the story about how King David brought the ark into Jerusalem. And there's been a lot of debate about what was Dave, David's motive uh, after they had captured Jerusalem from the Jebusites and made it the city of David and the center of the United Kingdoms of uh, Judah and Israel, there was some debate about, well, what, what was David's intention in bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem? And there are those that are uh, maybe more skeptical, like myself, and, and they think, well, David was trying to use the ark in order to uh, legitimize his um, civil powers as the king. And we see this in later uh, monarchies as well as, as they claim that they are you know, divinely appointed. And, and even uh, today in Britain, for example, uh, the king is considered to be the head of the Church of England, like this is somehow divinely uh, ordained that he would be the king and, uh, and therefore head of the church. There are some that attribute David's motives to be therefore less than pure, that it was just to gain political power. It's in the New Testament, he's described, David is described as a man after God's own heart. And so I like to think that David actually meant well. <laughs> uh, just like when I was passing the rolls, uh, David meant well. He meant to make God the center of your kingdom and to enthrone God at the center of your culture. Uh, it says in chapter 6, verse 2 of 2 Samuel, He and all his men set out from Bala of Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. So the idea was, hey, let's Let's put God at the center of our lives, uh, both culturally and uh, politically. And so they went to get the ark. So let's just talk for a minute about what the ark is. <clears throat> the ark was made to um, certain specifications in the Old Testament. Um, and it was basically a box, a, a gold, a acacia wood, encased in gold. It was basically a box in which the Mosaic Covenant, the Ten Commandments, were placed. And then over that covenant, there is a um, an atonement cover or mercy seat, as we used to call it in the older translations. Uh, there's a mercy seat over top of that. And there's golden angels that are one in they're molded right into that seat. And the angels have their wings outspread over top of the mercy seat. 
And then the Bible says that above the mercy seat, God would appear in a cloud to communicate with the people of Israel. And the mercy seat itself, according to the Old Testament law, was where blood from sacrifices would sometimes be brought by the high priest and smeared on the mercy seat so that when God's presence looked at his covenant with people, the covenant requirements would be covered by the blood of the sacrifice. So it's very, very symbolic of what is happening with Jesus in his crucifixion. And it was very symbolic of both the presence of God and the mercy of God um, and his covenant with his people. So uh, David brings this ark, but David, you know, David wasn't one of those people <laughs> that does things halfway. He was very zealous in this, and he kind of wanted to zhuzh up the way that the Old Testament said that the ark was to be transported. So he got a new cart made, and he had oxen pull it. And that wasn't the way that the Old Testament said that the ark was supposed to be transported. The ark was built with rings and then gold poles that went through the rings, and then only a certain family of Levites was authorized to pick up those poles and move the ark whenever the people of God moved to a new location. That's the only only way it was supposed to be moved. Well, David uh, decides, you know, this is this is such an awesome and auspicious occasion. We're going to juice this up. We're going to uh, put it on a new ark. We're going to provide modern transportation, and um, we're going to have this big celebration. And so they start into Jerusalem, and they're passing over a threshing floor, and the cart begins to rock. And one of the people walking with the ark, Uzzah, he reaches out to steady the ark, and God strikes him down. He's dead. Like, just like that. Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure that's great for me to say, but it scared the crap out of David. <laughs> David's like, whoa, 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 everybody stop, everybody stop. We're not taking this ark into Jerusalem. It's too dangerous. And so he uh, takes it and leaves it with Obed-Edom the Gittite. And months later, word comes to him that Obed-Edom the Gittite is being abundantly blessed by God. And so David comes back to get the ark, to bring it on in to Jerusalem. But guess what he does this time? This time, he comes with the poles, with the bearers to hold the poles. This time he does it the way God said it ought to be done. And they bring the ark into Jerusalem successfully. So here's some things to know about the history of the ark. It could bring blessing like it did to Obed-Edom. For example, it was in the house where or in the tent, I guess I should say, where God called Samuel to be the replacement for um, Eli. It uh, could also be not such good luck. For example, um, Saul tried to use it as a good luck charm. He would, had been losing in battle to the Philistines, and so he had his army bring the Ark of the Covenant and put it out in front of them, and they went in to fight the Philistines and the Philistines captured the ark and chased the Israelites away. So it was bad luck for Saul who tried to misuse the ark. He tried to be Lord of the Lord by using God as a good luck charm. Now, the Philistines have the ark and they decide it's not such a great thing because uh, their God keeps falling off his table, and his, in the end, his, even his hands break off, and he's frustrated before the ark, night after night. And the Philistines are struck with the plague, which they attribute to the presence of the ark of the covenant. And so they send it back with gifts to Israel. And so, happy ending? Well, not quite, because it turns out that 70 of the locals couldn't resist while the ark was there with them. They couldn't resist lifting the atonement cover, the mercy seat, off of the ark to look in where, where the Ten Commandments were. And when they did that, 
they were struck dead. 70 of them. 70 people got curious, 70 people were struck down. The Ark of the Covenant represented who God is and how God relates to his people, and it was to be treated in a certain way. So, was it God's will for the Ark to come to Jerusalem? I believe it was. But, when you try to transport the presence of God, the symbol of who God is, and use that, and do that in a way that isn't the way that God appointed, then that's disrespectful. And that's trying to manipulate God to your own end purposes. So it's good to do God's will. It's, it's, it's good to pass the rolls, but you've got to do it God's way. You've got to be careful not to, not, not to knock your glass of tea over, not to be disrespectful to the manifest presence of God above the ark. In the end, when he uh, goes to bring the ark into Jerusalem properly, it says that, um, and I assume that they're continuing to use all of the instruments that were described back in uh, verse 5, castanets or songs, harps, lyres, timbrels, ancient rattles, and cymbals. But it says also that they are dance, that David was dancing with all his might before the Lord, and every one of them was shouting and playing trumpets. Now, I am a, uh, a Western European descent, and the churches that cater to people like myself, we don't do a lot of shouting, and we don't do a lot of dancing as part of our worship. And we do have music thankful for that. Uh, that's a big deal to me. Um, but we don't have the motion of our bodies participating fully in the in our worship. And so I think it's pretty cool that they're doing all of this. And I wonder, you know, how would, how would uh, my church react <laughs> if people came in shouting and blowing trumpets and rattling their rattles and banging on the cymbals and uh, just celebrating that God was there in our worship. How, how would we react? I don't, I don't know. Um, but I appreciate those cultures, like the Hawaiian culture where uh, they incorporate hula as part of their worship and African-American culture, where uh, I see them getting up and moving around uh, the, uh, the, the sanctuary uh, and, and even the pageantry of you know, the, the Palm Sunday walking around the neighborhood carrying uh, palm fronds, those kinds of things to me, I, I think that's, it helps us to engage everything that we are into our worship. And, and I think of what Jesus said, the law. Um, he, he, Jesus told us that the greatest commandment was love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. So take everything that you are, everything that you have, and offer it up. Get it engaged in worship. And don't think of it as just something that you do in a sanctuary, but celebrate the presence of God wherever you are. And uh, no, I'm not saying, you know, you should be blowing trumpets and running down the aisles and, and work or anything like that, but I'm saying that every activity that we do should be involved in our in, in, as an offering of worship to the Lord. And when we do have times of corporate worship and where we want to celebrate the fact that the presence of the Lord is at the center of our gathering of people, it would be so cool, I think, if we if we could just get all of who we are engaged in those moments of worship. And so this week I invite you to think about how could we incorporate some of that spirit of joy and celebration at the presence of God while maintaining our respect, our fear, if you will, of who God is and how seriously doing the right thing the right way is to God and doing it in God's time. So God's will, God's way, 
in God's time. I hope that you found this meditation on uh, David's bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem as inspiring and uplifting and maybe even awe-inspiring as I did as I thought about it this week. May God bless you and may his presence bring you joy. In Jesus' name. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. Lift your name on high.